a senior in high school, and I was coming back from a college party with my brother, his girlfriend, and our friend Scooter. So we're driving back home. My brother's speeding. He's going like 10 miles over the speed limit, and we get pulled. And so the cop um, asked my brother to step out of the car. He starts to frisk me, and I'm freaking out, like, why are you stopping us? And his girlfriend, Monique, is like, you know, so Scooter, who's sitting next to me, um, he's not the sharpest knife in the drawer. He had a drink behind his ear that he forgot about, right? <laughs> so when the second cop car pulled up um, and they showed the flashlight in the car, he noticed the weed. So he was like, what's that? And Scooter just took off. Like, he jumped out the car, he ran across the highway, he dashed in the So the cops gave chase. And the next time I saw, saw Scooter, like he had a busted lip, a black eye, his face was swollen up now. He's 5'3", I think We were 17, 18, he's unarmed. And it just infuriated me that he was like treated like sport. And of course this happened before Sonderland, way before a lot of Castillo. But even back then, it engendered me, it engendered me this very, very, very problematic things that I love deeply. Um, good police procedurals are like candy to me. Luther or uh, the new show on uh, Amazon, Bosch. I, I read detective novels. Um, and why do I love them so much is what brought me here. And do I replace that? What would it look like to replace police in these things? And how would it still engage the side of me that wants it, or is there something in me that I should probably just sort of go, you need to go to sleep now, and your, your time is done, and something new is coming. I've helped Sean. I have written lots of novels and short stories and criticism, and I'm the publisher and founder of Auto Duck Press. Um, so my understanding of policing in theory and in practice has evolved over the years. I grew up in, a, in the 1950s in a suburban white community. My father worked in a factory and he knew a lot of the police on the local force. And his, his comments made quite clear to me that the police weren't there to protect and serve, that they were there uh, for the power structure. And the idea of calling in the police to solve a problem uh, was really pretty unthinkable. The police are for after things that happen. They don't, they don't really prevent assaults, etc. Um, later, 
uh, in my 30s, I was a, a witness to an attempted rape, which I and my fellow neighbors stopped. It was, it, there, there was a, a woman and a man in, a, in the parking lot, and I was lying awake, and I heard them talking, and, and I mean, their voices carried quite clearly their part pretty closely. And it was very obvious to me what was going to happen. So I called the police, but the, uh, the police, of course, didn't get there for 45 minutes. What happened was that the neighbors all stepped in and stopped it. And one neighbor in particular had a diving light that he had shown up a car. And that stopped the whole thing cold. Um, and, and I testified in court, and um, the defendant was found not guilty of attempted rape, in spite of all the neighbors testifying. Um, then my, my next experiences were as uh, an activist political activist and I did solidarity work and I was very interested in human rights. Well, I got arrested by choice during the, uh, the street action and the police, because I was a white middle-aged woman, I think, they, they sort of treated my arrest as a joke and I was able to make something of it in court because they had a photograph of the arresting officer standing next to me laughing. And they asked me if I had a weapon. They didn't search me. Um, and then I spent several hours handcuffed on the bus. And I realized um, through that experience that a lot of the functions we attribute to the police basically come from people choosing to comply with civil order because that's what they want. And, and in fact, the, the, the police would be powerless if everyone refused to obey them, which of course they're always very consistent on to the smallest and to the degree. So um, that's a great segue into the first yeah. thing that I wanted to kind of dive into, um, which ties a little bit into what you were talking about. Which I apologize to all of you. I, just, I was just telling Josh, I emailed everybody before the panel. I was like, oh, I'm being very you know, responsible or whatever. I BCC'd everybody <laughs> instead, yeah. of, instead of actually. Yeah, so I messed that up, but I apologize. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah so, so, so to, your, to your point, right? Like, how entrenched is the culture of law enforcement in our society, right? And not just in the United States, but worldwide, right? Because this isn't necessarily just a U.S. thing. Um, you know, digging a little bit deeper, perhaps into you know your work in tackling the prison industrial complex, and, and, and how do you how do you all see it? You know, how, how entrenched is this? How, how entrenched is this? Um, how entrenched is law enforcement? Well, you have people calling for the team who licked the blue bell ice cream to be jailed. <laughs> um, you have guards like guarding ice cream, right? Um, you have people calling the police on black folks every day just for having the audacity to exist in public spaces. I think that um, as a country, um, America is very punitive, and it's this rhetoric of law and order that is the lifeblood of mass incarceration. And I did not grow up with an understanding of the prison industrial system or dispar disparity um, sentencing until I was like in my mid-20s. And at that time, I thought, oh, you know, if I, I knew somebody on the block who sold drugs, or I had an uncle who went to jail, but it was just like, well, you did the crime, you did the time. But it wasn't until I came um, home and I saw a magazine with my classmate on the cover. She had a cap and gown on, and the, the headline read, Kemba's Nightmare. She, um, she was in an abusive relationship with a drug dealer, and she ended up he died, and she ended up um, taking a fall for him. She pleaded conspiracy um, in a drug ring, and as a first-time nonviolent offender, she received 25 years of middle school. And so that just um, opened my eyes to the huge cost of um, mass incarceration because Kimber was her mother. 
Um, she was six months, no, she was six months pregnant at the time that she was sentenced. And 80% of um, women who are in prison are mothers. And so I wanted to learn more about it because I realized I had been sheltered and didn't really know um, what was going on. So I reached out to um, Critical Resistance, which is a grassroots um, abolitionist group. And they work on um, halting the construction of new um, prisons. They work on um, reenfranchising formerly incarcerated people, make sure that they're, they're able to vote. And I just wanted to, I know there is no one solution to how we address uh, policing, but I just wanted to learn more, kind of get out of my bubble and, and, and learn what other people are going through, especially in terms of um, women who experience um, abuse. Kemba's boyfriend was physically and emotionally abusive to her. And there's this term, the um, abuse to prison pipeline, because I, I think the Vera Institute did a study that said 86% of women reported that they had they were in relationships with abusive men prior to um, prior to being sentenced. So I wanted to to see like like how are women who are abused and, and going through this trauma like 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 what solutions are there except prison as an alternative. So, so it's interesting you bring up the, the dimension of mm -hmm. how you know how how specifically women and women of color and black women specifically, right, are affected by by the ways in which our society devalues and puts them in positions where right. they're they're very generous, right? Right. What what are you know, and, and obviously anybody chime in, but uh, what are what are some of the the prevailing hero narratives that we talk about in our society? foment this culture, right? Like that 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 create the environment where, you know, we we we, we idolize this hyper militaristic or this patriarchal kind of like, you know, the, the hero cop kind of narrative, right? Like Yeah, I mean kind of ties back to the, the panel that I was just on um, men overcoming trauma because the Punisher is being glorified by the cops right now. There was the New York City the Punisher, the character of the Punisher uh, from Marvel Comics, uh, is being glorified by the police so much so that a New York police union uh, or like support group just asked each other to put on the Punisher image with a thin blue line on it to support other cops. Uh, there was a sheriff or something yeah. that actually painted yeah. the Punisher right. logo the, on the, his car. This, yes. um, this sort of activity coming from police is coming from a place of punitive violence. Right. And I mean, to abolish the police, we have to dismantle this joy in punitive violence uh, that we have against people, uh, which is, and, and to acknowledge that that's why we're doing it to start with. Because, oh no, we have to keep ourselves safe. It's not how we keep ourselves safe. We keep ourselves safe by stop, stopping the problem before it started by saying, hey, therapy is so important to us that we're going to treat people's trauma as it happens and, allow, and make it comfortable for us to talk about trauma and the things that drive us to be bad, to do bad things to people, to hurt people, to steal, to cheat, to act out. Uh, and also to say that, you know, obviously we have this <coughs> goal of punishing people who were taught are less than us. White people are taught that it's okay to punish black people disproportionately. And uh, because of our race. Mental, mentally ill yeah. people. Mental, um, mental, oh, prisons yes. are where many of them wind up. Absolutely. So the, the, the mental illness you mentioned is, 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 is a huge component. Yes. Of, of because who do we call when someone right. is, uh, has lost control of themselves? Mm -hmm. So what, what, are, what are some of the functions that, that police perform, ostensibly perform now that, that could be better fulfilled by other kinds of entities? And I feel like, Chelsea, you might, you might have a lot yeah. to say here. Um, so I would say like the movement to end sexual violence, and, and specifically child sexual abuse, um, is actually really illustrative of the ways that law enforcement has become so kind of deeply entrenched in efforts to end violence. Um, 
over time, the mainstream movement really, you know, the boundaries between the mainstream movement and sexual violence and, and the state, including law enforcement, really kind of blurred. Um, and so we have domestic violence shelters and rape crisis programs that are literally in like police precincts too, um, which for, for folks with various marginalizations, like, it's not safe to go and report or to go seek out a victim advocate if you're needing help. Um, so in, I'm really glad that you brought up critical resistance. Um, so in 2001, Insight, which is a women of color organizing collective against violence and critical resistance, put out a call to social justice organizers to develop strategies to respond to gender-based violence that also address state violence. Um, and I think that's, that's where we're going here too. Um, and so we've been talking about kind of like actual strategies too, and one that I'd like to focus on is um, something that I learned from the Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective, um, specifically from Liam Mingus, and that's um, pod mapping. So your pod is basically who are you going to call when you've been harmed or when you've seen harm, or or if somebody you know is causing harm, you know who are those kind of like core people that you're going to call on and. Well, I think the example that you brought up earlier, too, of, of neighbors just coming together and intervening um, is, is really strong, and I think we really should be looking more at the community level yes. rather than looking at kind of like larger bureaucratic uh, systems. I say this as someone working in one, but really like focusing on community-based alternatives is um, kind of the best way to care for each other. Chelsea's point. Um, activist um, Marianne Kaba, she has, a, yeah, she's awesome. she's amazing. Um, she, <laughs> she founded a group called Survive and Punish, um, which helps women who um, are victims of abuse um, and who they have killed their abuser. Um, like, um, or not even killed, um, Marissa Alexander fired a warning shot um, at her abusive ex and she received like 20 years. And so, um, so Miriam's organization works to like to prevent women from being um, from going to the abuse to prison, abuse to prison pipeline, being trapped in that pipeline. So one of the things you were talking about, Chelsea, was, was, was the ways in which community, and Tim mentioned it as well, just the ways in which communities can step in to to it, it, at, at that moment, you know, when you're trying to prevent a crime when you're trying to prevent harm from happening, right? Are, what are some of the things that you've worked with with regards to the justice system, seeking justice, transforming justice, as opposed yeah. to, you know, what we have now, which is basically like, throw the book in someone and stick in jail, right? Yeah, one of, um, I guess, you know, because like we have this framework that asks, like what law was broken, you know, who broke it, and how do we punish them? Um, you know, there are these other frameworks that ask just different um, restorative justice, for example, is something that's kind of compatible with the criminal legal system as it currently stands, and I think is kind of a neat step, a good stepping point into um, like incremental reforms. Um, but a restorative justice approach is going to ask more about like who is harmed, um, what relationships have been disrupted by this harm, um, and whose obligation is it to repair the harm that's been done. Um, there are a number of diversion programs that are starting to get implemented in by like prosecutors um, throughout the country. The ones I know best are on the West Coast. Um, and they tend to be used with youth who have, who have done harm. Um, you know, where, where they say, okay, like let's figure out an alternative to incarceration that um, doesn't necessarily mean we're going to increase surveillance, but rather we're focusing on on how a young person can work on this and really transform their behaviors. Um, and not set their path on the right. destiny mm -hmm. that right now is pretty much guaranteed. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, yes. it's the exception <coughs> for, for young people to be able to get off of that trajectory. And one of the you know, most important things that you know, I've been about is the importance of building relationships and trust. Um, you know, our current system really isolates all of us. Um, and, and 
focuses on like crime as a harm that's kind of an individual harm or it's, it's harm against the state um, when we really need to look at, at harm as something that affects the community. It's, um, it's not just one person who's been harmed. And prisons are not just punishing one person. Yeah. We, we, oh. need to, we need to discover that they're actually punishing the whole, the whole community, yeah. the whole family, the whole community, yeah. and that, you know, if you want justice, all you're really getting in prison is revenge. Right. Because it will be really horrible for the person, but that's it. You've got, you've got to make that person suffer, and then they come back and bring that suffering out. That's a, that's, that's a really interesting point, like just the fact that, you know, you, you, so there's, there's two components there, right? Like, when you incarcerate somebody, you take them away, you put them, you, 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 you effectively disappear. From their community, that hole, you know, leaves a lot of other people who are either dependent either emotionally or substantially or whatever, very much adrift. Um, and obviously, it's tied into you know some of the stuff that you were talking about in, in, in your in your preamble to the panel, just you know, the, the questions of class and race and gender that are that you know, not everybody is, is created equally, right? And different people are treated different ways by the system. Um, yeah, 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 right? That's, 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 that's exactly. Um, so, so we've been talking a little bit about, you know, what are these functions that perhaps could be done differently. Um, oh, okay, excuse oh, yeah. me. I'll, I'll chime in here. We continually get news stories of judges saying about certain uh, well, well off defendants yeah. that it would ruin their lives and their families' lives, and so they can't be sent to prison. Yeah. So this is well understood. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just not, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Literally everyone knows that Jeffrey Epstein bought his uh, quote unquote sentence in which, you know, he was in jail one day out of seven. Um, no, he slept there nights. He, he slept there nights. He's his own way with his own Yeah, uh, you know, like the, the, amount, the amount of like, and, but we, we're, we can't let go of it. Our hand is in the jar grasping at this. Uh, cookie of revenge. Uh, I mean that. I want revenge based on what she just said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, on the other hand, when we let go of the cookie and say, "Okay, look, we just need to fix society." I yeah. I understand rage and anger at people and the desire to do something about the assholes at the top. Uh, and you know, bloody revolution is definitely an option. <laughs> um, <laughs> and but we've been down that path before. Like we had the French Revolution, that didn't fix it neither. Um, and I think a I think a different path is is looking at this desire Asking for revenge in us and questions. saying, hey, I've got this anger. Is the is the desire for revenge going to? It, it, it will make the anger feel good, but what's what's the effect after that? Where where does it go? And I mean, we we know. Where it goes, we know inside of ourselves that yes, having this asshole Jeffrey Epstein suffer for the rest of his life would be really entertaining. But the system that we use to do it destroys our world. Right, and does punishing that individual person actually transform the conditions that then make that harm happen? It, it, does, it doesn't. I mean, I have a I have a cousin who is in the prison system, and when he came home, he just committed elder abuse, he, he stole from people. He didn't really have any skills or, or any compassion, really. So it didn't rehabilitate him, it just made it worse. When really what people need is, is stronger bonds with each other and to be able to see each other as fully human, even if we fucked up. Tell the story all the time, and I'm not going to dive into the whole story. But you know, my, one of the biggest teachable moments that I had was the worst finger in my life, basically, confronted me with the very real consequences of what I was doing, you know, and, and how that affected it personally, or could have affected it personally, the people around me. And that was much more powerful, and much more effective than any punishment or any grounding or anything right. like that, you know, and that's kind of the same. It's kind of the same deal, right? You want to, you want to increase a person's 
empathy and connection to their communities so that they really understand what the consequences are, you know, what their actions are, right? Um, so, so just to kind of flip it and to bring it around to, you know, we're at a literary convention, right? So, um, what are some, and I, 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 I preface this question with, with, with the caveat that I don't know that this is true. I don't know that these are there are things that need to be this way. But what are what are some functions or situations that the police, as we understand them today, are, are quote unquote uniquely suited to dealing with? Right? Like, and, and as I, I said, I, I don't necessarily think that that's the case. Or through the lens of fiction, you know, you mentioned you mentioned your love of procedurals and, and all this stuff. Like, what are what are the, what are the tropes? What are the the kinds of the the, the yeah, the tropes of these forms that are that are compelling and that need to be engaged with in society, you know, within the context of, of, of yeah. what we're talking about. Everyone yeah. who watches the police procedurals also probably enjoys mysteries. Like you wanna solve you wanna solve something, you wanna get to the bottom of something. You want to see it's it's really engaging uh, and, and nonviolent. Uh, the TV show Monk mm. had Tony Shalhoub using his brain or, or Sherlock, I mean to some extent, but you wanna see somebody outsmart somebody doing something wrong. Um, but, you know, I could turn that on its head and say, well, what about Leverage, which is totally outside of the system, and we just have this ragtag team of really cool people writing wrongs uh, with their brains, which I think is much, actually much more deeply satisfying uh, than doing it as part of the police. Uh, making, making things better. Uh, one of my favorite novels of all time is Bridge of Birds by Barry Hewitt, uh, in which the, not the protagonist, but his mentor or whatever, uh, had his hand at, you know, uh, being a cop, essentially, and said that, you know, basically all he could come up with was really effective revenge. So he just decided to solve really interesting mysteries for the rest of his life, uh, which I think is a good commentary. I think solving really interesting, fun mysteries and making things better would satisfy that urge. Uh, a, a leverage in space could do that, you know, uh, or um, the expanse, which is kind of all over the place with police and criminals and activity. But like, what do we do to uh, to fix things to make the world a better place? You know, I'd like the constant wonder if the um, detective story, especially the police procedural, even. If it's just a complete fantasy now, because in the United States and a lot of cities, the police do not investigate murders. They, I mean, <laughs> Chicago, of course, is the primary example. But um, I don't know how how well those tropes conform to reality, or or if they ever did. So I'm actually rather curious to know if police really investigate anything, or what they do investigate. I know that they're there to back up uh, the prosecutors, and they spend time getting the evidence they need and testifying in court. And, but um, I'm not sure if they actually solve crimes. If you report a theft, for instance, it's just goes into their statistics and they give you a, a little lecture about how to make your house safer against break-ins, which of course is the rational way to approach it. Uh, I mean, you don't really expect the police to, to um, prevent theft of somebody from breaking into your house, do you? Does anybody here believe that they? <laughs> Yeah, it's a, they're always after. I think if they steal something from a really rich person, they're oh, probably get results. Oh, well, yes. <laughs> right. But that's another matter. <laughs> it depends on the case. It depends on the precinct. It depends on who's been alarmed. It depends on who's the It's it's yeah it's one of those things where like and, and, and you know like we were talking about at the top of the hour the, the, the police are now their 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 purview is so broad right so they touch you know 
they touch areas of you know, mental health, they touch areas of community service, they touch areas of uh, crime prevention, they touch areas of you know, investigation, things like that, where like they are much better. It, it feels like just, you know, when you've got a hammer, every problem looks like a man, right? So, you know, what are what are other ways that 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 we can kind of build up competencies as a society to engage with these problems that don't necessarily fall into the purview of problems, into that punitive, you know, that punitive mode, right? I'm going to make a plug for supporting your local rape crisis program. Yes. Um, at this yes. conference in particular, we've got the Boston Area Rape Crisis Center that does a bystander intervention training each year now. Um, and if you see those around, we can do them. Um, Boston Area Rape Crisis Center. Um, I, I teach some bystander intervention trainings as well, too. And really what that emphasizes is that we all have a role to play. Um, you know, in, in identifying like actions that, that could escalate into something else and to prevent something from happening at all. Um, and like as peers and as friends and as neighbors, there was a, that power. There was a bystander training that yeah. did this. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it was this morning, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And white people, please stop calling the cops. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> don't call the cops. Don't please. call the cops. Just don't call the cops. I was there at the training, and they, we, we talked about thinking very carefully about when to call the cops. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I see a few hands have been going up. I, I'd like to open it up to questions with the, with the, with the caveat, like, fucking questions people. <laughs> <laughs> Like, like the panel that I was on before, yeah, if you've got an essay, I'd love to read it, right. tweet it, but not, you know, um, I think you've, you've had to put your head up. You know, I was more thinking about, um, historically, American police sort of started with the slave patrols, yeah. Yeah. and they were, you know, the whole aim was protecting property rather than people. Um, what do you think about the idea of what if we separated? the sort of policing to protect property and the policing to protect people, would that eventually give us some kind of workable system or? No. No? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, unless we disarm them completely. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Just like guys with magnifying glasses. If you could no. do whatever you wanted, whether or not uh, I mean, there's so, if you, if you really start kind of digging deep and, and keeping an open mind and just really questioning everything, there's so that actually require something like what we understand. You know, like my, my, my. In, in, oh, in European society, we didn't really have police until the 19th century. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, globally. Yeah. Getting back to fiction, there's a BD or DB Jackson who has a uh, Revolutionary War era thief taker magician series. <laughs> um, and basically, his job is to track down property theft from rich people. Wow. And be people off the sorcery. Corey, and then you. Um, so one of the things that this is um, reminding me of is that I've always heard about police procedurals as a fantasy of justice, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the more I listen to y'all, the more I think about our whole conception of the justice system as a fantasy of justice. <laughs> sure. And so my question is, um, what in fiction or in real life, what um, what is there that helps us shift that paradigm away from that non-functional fantasy to something that's integrated in society in a, in a beneficial way that actually, you know, so we've heard about transformative justice and there's nothing fiction. I just, I'd love to hear more about it because even I, like, I'm having, I'm having trouble with the paradigm shift and I'm like, I'm pretty on board with this. So I like, would love to see some fiction based on, like, this conversation. Um, but, like, Adrian Marie Brown is an author that I've been kind of looking at who's, like, sort of thinking, creatively about like building communities of care. Um, and that's something that I would recommend going towards too. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if this is exactly to your question, but one of the things, Becky Chambers kind of does a little bit of this in some of her work, where, you know, people commit crimes, they, they, they do bad things, but you get a very, well-rounded picture of the consequences and the repercussions and the ramifications and the stakes and yeah yeah it's it's that kind of thing. Um, you you had your yeah. So this is building off uh, your question. So uh, the police were once understood historically as emancipatory, right? They were actually what was needed to protect private property 
property rights, which would liberate the serfs into becoming their own as workers, the third estate from the clergy and the aristocracy. And this is what really moved us, uh, one key component that moved us out of feudal society into modern society. And so when I talk with many uh, sort of uh, people my age, there's a conception of the police as arbitrating morals, as opposed to, say, perhaps enforcing class difference, which is the phenomenal form it's taken after it doesn't seem that they're fulfilling uh, enforcing freedoms, but rather unfreedom. And uh, looking back in history at the writings of the utopian socialists like Proudhon, Saint-Simon, and folks like Vladimir Lenin, it seems they had a much higher imagination as to the necessity of the state, the armed forces of uh, men, right, the police, and its interrelationship with the state and freedom than anything I would see written nowadays. And so uh, perhaps I'm being a bit cynical in my prognosis for this. Sir, what opportunities are there nowadays in what I would say the limited imagination we have relative to the past in being able to come up with uh, useful fantasies of moving beyond, uh, say, the police as just merely being a sort of arbitrator of a ahistorical or transhistorical battle of like sort of uh, friend versus foe throughout history, because it's certainly not that, right? Like the events I described, they weren't mere historical contingencies. They moved us into radically different eras. Sorry, that was a really long over our question. <laughs> Does anybody want to jump in? Or? From a very, very tight, focused viewpoint, I think on occasion when Americans get to understand uh, what prisons are like in more liberal, more uh, less punitive countries, which are still not great, by the way, uh, and still policing goes on, and it's still uh, primarily the tool of the wealthy and the powerful, but still there is an attempt at rehabilitation post police that maybe makes what's going on post police a little bit more palatable. It could lead us to say, hey, police don't need guns. Police don't need to beat the crap out of you to do these things. To say, hey, you did something that's dangerous to society. We need to find a path for your rehabilitation. Yeah, uh, when their sentences are served, they don't just kick them out yeah. without resources, I think, <laughs> which we do. I think rehabilitating the justice system coming first would allow us to restructure the police. In New York, we're kind of trying to do some of that. Mm -hmm. um, New York just passed the Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act, which was deeply informed by incarcerated, formerly incarcerated women, um, that is really a reform in the great scheme of things um, that provides alternatives to incarceration for criminalized survivors of gender-based violence, um, where it's really still, it's imperfect, right? It's up to the judge's discretion um, what kind of sentencing happens here, but it creates other possibilities, and what we're trying, what we're really doing is imagining other possibilities. Just because it is this way now, it doesn't have to be, it was never inevitable. One thing I wanted to mention that a lot of people don't think about is the trauma that people of color experience with all of these police shootings. Like I get so traumatized when I when I hear about these shootings and and little to no consequences that the police are suffering. And it's just like okay, um, you know, it's like I don't even want to hear about it anymore. But it's but as writers, we have a responsibility to call out this inhumanity. Um, one writer that I love, um, her name is Dicey Grainer. She has a, a story called Black and Deadly, and it uses magic as a, as a form of resistance. Because a lot of a lot of people who are speaking out um, in Black matters are are Black women. And are, um, and so she talks about harnessing ancestor energy to to combat police brutality. Um, on the date of the sentencing of um, uh, the 
names are leaving me because yeah, I'm under stress. So uh, yeah. The guy who shot the kid, names are completely leaving my head over um, yeah, um, the bag of No, no. Um, oh, 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 oh. Yeah, Zimmerman. Zimmerman. Yeah. Zimmerman's sentencing uh, was during a rear con. Yeah. And I was hanging out with Mickey Kendall at the time, who I don't know if anyone knows, yeah. but we basically just clung to each other for the rest yeah. of the evening. It was, it was so, so much more traumatic to me um, because of her kids and because of she's a black woman and just all this stuff going on. But yeah, that, it really struck home at that point in a way that I never had before because I was just there and watching the outpouring of the show. It was really, really traumatic. Uh, yeah, um, in my other life, I'm a psych nurse. I work in one of the state hospitals and we get a lot of people in from different home jobs. Um, part of my gut sense is this is a long term project. A lot of the people who commit crimes, in, uh, street crimes, are hugely traumatized people who probably had parents who were hugely traumatized. Um, this is a long term project. There, I can talk about the exceptions at another point, but it's a long term project is what I'm saying, and trauma, if you want to understand mental health, start with trauma. Excuse me, never mind the fancy psychoanalytic theories, trauma, trauma, and more trauma. Throw in a little lead poisoning, throw in a toxic society. Uh, and what you said, I, my father was a red diaper baby. As a kid, I was taught the police were not your friend. They were there to protect property. What's a red diaper baby? Uh, my grandfather was a communist. Oh, okay. Active. Gotcha. Again, that movement. And and he was socialized with lots of other, you know, uh, socially active people. It was, you know, sometimes there were there were there were um, uh, youth camps yep. to teach you how to be a good socialist. I mean, you know, it's its own yes. ecosystem. It's, it's like black. It's like a black Muslim separatism. It's own, a total. A total separate system. Sometimes. Sometimes. I appreciate you bringing up like trauma and that has been coming up um, because really trauma is is something that our society at large refuses to deal with. Um, intergenerational trauma, especially, um, is something that is kind of just now getting attention as well to um, at least in broader conversations. Um, but yeah. I mean, one of the things that I had actually appreciate you also bringing up Mary Kala, who I've been working on, but one, one of the things I've learned from her is, you know, with hurt people, hurt people, mm -hmm. do, um, and one of the biggest ways we can prevent further violence is to care for people who have been harmed or people who have dealt with trauma and have untreated trauma. Sure. So we have time for one more question over here. Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Um, just has anybody, have, have any of you thought about a concrete system, okay? Somebody murders my husband today and the police have been abolished yesterday. Who's going to investigate that or find the person or help me out? Have, you, have any of you thought like, oh, I'm going to write this story and here are the people that are going to do that. And here's how they're going to do it. There are some models, um, you know, increasingly in, in some some judges and some um, prosecutors are implementing kind of restorative justice processes, mm -hmm. uh, where sometimes it's a circle process where kind of everybody who's been impacted by something gets together in a room and and really kind of talks it through. This only works if kind of all parties who've been involved are willing to, to talk openly and can do so. Um, does that include? I'm sorry. Does that include the person who killed my husband? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So if that person is open to it and is like, okay, I'm ready to talk openly and, and address the harm that I've caused, that can work um, in some scenarios. But that relates um, to the trauma that you're just telling yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. willing to. Yeah, and, like and that requires, you know, trained facilitators, people who are, who are equipped to deal with trauma. Um, and yeah, so there are some models that folks are, are developing. Is there some place, like, you know, yeah. Um, think so, <coughs> common justice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. common justice um, is for New York. Uh, 
um, they have they offer survivor centered accountability. Yeah. Um, that's one place. Common justice. Um, the Howard Zare Z E H R initiative. Um, they're working on this. Um, there's a woman named Sujata Malika who uh, previously worked as a defense attorney. Um, who's been developing some of these models too. And as far as kind of stuff outside of the criminal justice system, suffer from that. Um, the Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective has done some really cool work. Um, there's also an online resource um, that Miriam Kaba kind of co-curated, really co-curated, called Transform Harm. Uh, that's worth checking out. It's transformharm.org. Cool. Um, so we've got like two minutes left. Maybe we've got one. Yes, one more. Thank you. Really quick, I'm wondering, as people on the panel, what narrative would you love to see writers create that can help to subvert the system that we have and move us towards this new system? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Sorry, like, what can we do as writers? Like, we, would you prefer, like, if I could write anything, you're like, I would love to see a book that tackles X, because that would really help to, like, push us away from our current punitive police-focused system into mm -hmm. something else. What could I be writing, or could any of us be writing? I mean, Thanks. I would love to see your premise, you know, fleshed out in, in a narrative, right? Like, somebody killed my husband, you know? Like, do we know who that person is? Maybe, maybe not, but, you know, that's a premise that, you know, that might be a, a good way to engage with these issues, right? How do I do that without involving what we understand as, as law enforcement, right? And taking advantage of, you know, transport. And how would we solve some action model. Um, although he got bit by the suck fairy uh, in my readings, uh, Spider Robinson uh, had Calham's Cross Time Saloon, which was people helping each other overcome trauma, and then at the end of the first novel, uh, an alien comes and tries, uh, my, my job here is to destroy the world. I didn't realize that you have love, but I have to destroy the world. And the bar just sits there and takes care of him. They don't try and kill him. And they do find a way to like stop him from blowing up the world, but um, it was only because they had empathy towards him that they could do that. So I think stories that show empathy are solving problems uh, that are violent problems might work. And I also mentioned like this technique of pod mapping too. Like, that could be something I'd love mm -hmm. to see. Something whether it's literally called that or not, um, but you know, focusing on like who can I call on for help, like who can I do that in my life? Um, so that about wraps us up. Uh, is there anything that I have one last thing? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, dismantling the, the prison system doesn't mean freedom from consequences. I mean, people should pay consequences. Um, rapists, you know, people assault people should. It should have consequences, okay? but it's looking at the current system of policing is not working. It's just looking at creative solutions to that, whether community-based or survivor-based um, solutions to the current policing system.